All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to get started since it's uh, 730. So on Monday, we went over switch circuits, which kind of ended the differential equation discussion. And then last time I went over convolution and I posted another video about basically convolution. Uh, this question, questions, okay. Uh, this class, we're just gonna go over convolution again and then go over some example circuits. I posted a video, not of our lecture, but of a previous lecture that covered similar material that from what we covered last class. So like the last 12 minutes, basically, I go over the two pulses graphically if you need to watch that again. Additionally, I in that particular video, I go over it algebraically, how you could actually solve such a thing. It's also kind of a mess, but uh, because there's four different transition regions. But yeah, so I guess one thing when you're doing these convolution questions, there's two things. You need to know graphically how to convolve the two little pulses. And additionally, you really need to know how to find the limits when you have unit step functions or time shifted unit stem functions. So primarily that's how we use convolution uh, to convolve with functions that have a unit step function as part of it. In particular is because we will, in the next lectures, actually on Wednesday's lecture, we'll derive the impulse response and the impulse response basically says that the solution to any circuit can be just uh, derived by a, a convolution of the input to the output. And a lot of inputs have time-shifted unit step functions. And so you have to kind of know how to convolve with unit step functions in order to be able to do that well. Next lecture is discrete convolution, which will be online because I'm not gonna be here Monday and Wednesday. And so will that lecture. 
And for discrete convolution, that's going to be a short lecture because it's a topic that, I mean, it's not that uh, complicated. Um, so yeah, that's basically next week. So before I start today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research just to kind of motivate why we are learning these circuits and why they are so uh, important. And in particular, they're important because they show up almost everywhere in almost every application. Um, so I work in an area called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so the idea is that you have a, an antenna or a coil. And then that coil is, uh, you put a really strong current through that coil, and so it generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field actually causes uh, electric fields in the brain, and those electric fields cause ions to flow out of the membranes of cells, and so they cause action potentials, and they kind of activate new brain regions. And so once you activate a brain region, kind of that goes into the body, and then you get some kind of behavioral response. So in this schematic here, you're showing kind of the, uh, someone's measuring like their finger movement due to the fact that you're stimulating the motor cortex. Uh, so if you look at this system here, right, this really big expensive system, this thing here actually, you can actually model as a capacitor that's been charged for a VCs of zero plus to about two to five kilovolts. Well, that, that would be your initial condition. And then uh, from the circuit's perspective, what you do is you have a switch, which actually sits here near the coil. And the coil, you can actually model as it being an inductor with a little resistor in a series with it. And so if you wanna know how the current uh, looks, when you click the little button on the coil, all you do is you have to kind of analyze one of these switch circuits. So here you have a, the capacitance of the power driving device, which is just a bunch of batteries or charged capacitors. You flip the switch and then all the a strong current kind of starts flowing forward. And depending on the how you design this coil to have an L or an R, that's gonna that's gonna determine whether you get a waveform that looks like this, or you get a waveform that looks like this, or you get a waveform that looks like that. And so when we engineer these things, actually we have to pay a lot of attention to this because we actually want a waveform that looks more like this. And ideally this damping is minimal. And so we have to make sure that these coils have little resistance associated with them. And so a lot of engineering goes into it. Uh, we also have to make sure that we have a high enough inductance so that the oscillations occur at the frequency that we want. And in particular, we want the frequencies, we, we, we need these oscillations to, uh, so in particular, we don't want these, the, the output of the coil to vary too rapidly because if it varies very rapidly, it won't stimulate cells. So it needs to vary at somewhat of a, it has to have a somewhat large enough period. And uh, as it turns out to figure out what a large enough period is, you go to another circuit. And this is uh, something that you all have studied, which is just a resistor in series, uh, sorry, in a capacitor in series, in parallel with a uh, resistor. So this particular circuit model actually models the exchange of ions between a cell. So you know ions are charged particles, and if they move, you can think of them as an electric current. And so depending on how many particles you move, you can think of that as charge moving, or another way to say that, that's a current. And so we gen we associate a current with each each ionic species, <clears throat> but to actually determine the dynamics of the cell or the exchange of ions between the inside and the outside of the cell, we solve this circuit. And not only that, uh, we typically kind of uh, when we try to understand how these electric fields are affecting the neuron. We typically either uh, think of these uh, these electric fields as either an injected current or a voltage source sitting outside of the cell, and that voltage source is driving the circuit. 
Well, one thing that uh, we learned in this class is that if the if we want to induce if we want to have a large voltage drop from the inside to the outside, uh, what would happen if we put a very fast varying time signal or a high frequency signal to the circuit? How does the capacitor behave? It, it behaves as a, as a short when you have high frequency, because remember it's one over J omega C. So if omega is large, it's like a zero. So what that really means is that uh, if you have a very large, uh, a very high frequency, this thing behaves as a short. And so you get a very low voltage difference between the, uh, it's very difficult to get a voltage difference between the inside and the outside. And that's why the pulses are, not very efficient. Whereas if you have a slow enough pulse, then this starts to behave kind of as a low impedance or open. And as a result, you will actually get a large voltage uh, across this, uh, or you can get a large voltage across the, from the inside to the outside. And so as you can see, just with the knowledge of an RC circuit and an RLC circuit, you can pretty much understand this whole system. Now, people typically in uh, in the neurosciences, in the biomedical fields, they talk about the so-called strength duration curves. And what these strength duration curves basically say is that in order to get a certain voltage difference here, I mean, roughly, I'm, I'm kind of uh, simplifying it slightly, uh, depending on the duration of the curve of the poles, I need different levels of current. And so if I want to get a fixed voltage V here, if, I, if the frequency of this applied pulse is uh, higher, meaning that the duration is lower, I will need more current. Whereas if the duration of the pulse is long, then I will need less current. Um, well, now you can understand what these, the, strength duration cur curves are really saying that basically this capacitor kind of makes it harder and harder to get a hot high voltage drop if you increase the frequency. And in particular, what these strength duration curves also do, also kind of predict is kind of the, how long it takes you to respond to something. So as you can see here, it takes microseconds to uh, respond, to have a sensory response. So if you touch like a heating element, it's gonna take a microsecond before you actually realize, oh, this is hot. Um, and depending on the type of pain, there's different latencies. Anyway, but my point is not here to kind of teach you kind of some non-related. I'm just trying to show you that a lot of these circuits are actually everywhere uh, and even in obscure fields that you would think are totally unrelated. Go ahead. You mean in uh in uh in stimulation? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the the main thing you want is you want to minimize the amount of charge in the poles. So, uh, if you think of this uh kind of pulse here or this pulse here, one one metric that people will use to say kind of which duration is ideal. So if this is duration one, and this is duration two. You look at the area under this curve and the area under this curve, and you try to say kind of the one that has less area associated with it um, is the one that is more favorable. So that's kind of one metric. There's actually a lot of engineering because uh, it's easier to generate these uh, fast varying pulses than the low varying pulses but then uh, at a given current strength, but then you kind of have a trade-off that as you increase the frequency, then you need more current or a, high, a peak, higher peak value. And so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a more of an engineering question. Anyway, all right. So today we're gonna basically review what we did in the past two days. And so, like I said, we looked at switch circuits and we typically solve for continuous quantity. So we're gonna look at an example a little later. And then last class, we looked at convolution, which is basically takes two functions and then it computes this integral for each instant in time. 
So convolution is an operator. Uh, so basically you input two functions and you get another function. And it has the same properties of multiplication. So there's commutative, associative, distributive, and it has a an identity called the delta function. And then there are these additional properties. And the two more most important ones are this one, convolution with the unit step function and convolution with a delta function or a time shifted delta function. All right, so let's go through an example. I wanted to start not with the circuit one because convolution is something we haven't covered as much. So let's look at this example first and then we'll look at the circuit ones at the end. Um, so here it's asking us to find the convolution of these two things. And so basically we can just literally take our definition of convolution and say that this is just the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative five t u sub t minus two, oops, sorry. How, how use of t minus tau minus three t tau. So when you have these time shifted ones, it's always good to put this argument in parentheses so that you kind of do the correct replacement. So you're always going to replace the t minus tau uh, in parentheses. So if this was multiplied by three, if you put it in parentheses, you'll kind of multiply it correctly. Okay, so at this point, kind of the first question you should always ask yourself is, when is this zero? Where? Yeah, so whenever tau minus two is less than zero, this is zero, which implies whenever tau is less than two. And so based on this, what is the integral from e to the negative five t u of tau minus two u sub t minus tau minus three t tau from negative infinity to two? Zero, okay, so that means that we can actually effectively just take this limit and turn it into two. Because we said that from negative infinity to two, that integral is zero. Is that uh, clear? Okay, so now we go to the other limit. So I'm gonna be honest, I when I was an undergrad, I had a lot of trouble with these limits and I came up with this, uh, system, which is just basically write the inequality and do the algebra, and uh, it made my life a lot better. So that's why this is how I teach it. Uh, there are many ways to do this, but I feel like this is, yeah. All right, so when is this thing zero? When this is less than zero. So now you can just say when tau is greater than uh, t minus three, right? All I, all I did was move the tau to the other side, basically. And so to move the tau to the other side, it flipped the uh, inequality. Okay, so then that tells me that the integral from uh, t minus three to infinity of e to the negative five tau u sub tau minus two u sub t minus tau minus three d tau is equal to okay so that since this is equal to zero then that means that i can actually change this limit to t minus three what the question Oh, because here you see the the this thing is zero whenever tau is greater than t minus three. So it's zero from t minus three to infinity. And so that means that the integral from t minus three to infinity of this thing is just going to be zero. 
And so I can just go from zero, two to t minus three because this just adds zero to my result. So at this point now we uh, we have the limits. So now we can just uh, now we need to do one more little thing, which is that. So this inequality told us that from t minus three to infinity, this function is zero. And then we also had another inequality which said that for tau less than two, or from uh, negative infinity to two. No, it's two because see, this is tau minus two less than zero, and then you just solve for tau, so you get two less than. This is why I always just do the inequality. Uh, the less you think, the better you'll do. <laughs> so just literally take the argument, plug it into an equality, solve for tau. And that will give you the truth. Don't try to visualize it. Go ahead. Uh, so to decide like, from what tau it goes to, like you just said, you solve for it. So how do I know if it goes from a negative infinity to that value I call for or from like that value yeah, so I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm trying to say. So here it says tau less than two. So that means tau from negative infinity to two, because those are all the possible taus, right? And here it's tau greater than t minus three. So it's really t minus three to infinity. It could be any of those values. So tau belongs to, and tau belongs to this. Okay, but now that we have these two inequalities, uh, what else do we know about this integral? What would happen if this t minus three uh, happened to be less than two? Yeah, so basically we would have that this whole integral is equal to zero whenever t minus three is less than two, because that would mean that this in the whole range, it would be zero because uh, it would be zero from negative infinity to two, and it would be zero from a number less than two to infinity. So it's infinity from it's zero from negative infinity to infinity. And so another way to say that is that from t less than five, this thing is zero. Cool. So now uh, now we actually get to the top two part of the class, and now we actually do have to do the integral. So we know now that this is just the integral from two t minus three e to the negative five tau d tau for t greater than or equal to five. And so now we have to actually do the integration. So the integral of e to the negative five tau is just uh, negative one over five e to the negative five tau. And it's just the, evaluated at two and at t minus three. And so that's going to give us, it's going to give us, a, well, negative one over five e to the negative five t minus three minus e to the negative 10. And uh, now because this thing is zero for t less than five, what do we have to multiply it here by use of what? Yeah, so we just multiply it by a t minus five and that t minus five effectively is zero whenever t is less than five. And it's one whenever it's t is greater than five. And so it takes care of the two cases basically for us. And so that's our final solution. And here's kind of the algebra for that. Is this clear to everyone? Um, yeah. If you can do this, you, you're kind of somewhat good in this section. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I'm just confused on the zero from t minus three less than so you mean from two to t minus three? No, no, no. Like the t minus three less than two. Like the zero. 
t minus three less than two. Oh, so t minus three has to be less than, if t minus three is less than two, that means that you're going from, let's say, let's say, let's say, okay, let's just say that t is four, okay? So that's a number less than five, okay? Yeah. Then the upper limit would actually be uh, negative, or it would actually be one, right? So you're going from two to one, right? But then this u of tau minus two is zero in that whole range. Because remember that uh, u sub tau minus two is zero from negative infinity to two. So it's gonna be zero from two to ne to one, basically, or from one to two. I'm just gonna like, get that expression. Can you just like find it even out? What did you say the two minus two left in the middle of the two? Yeah, I combined the two bounds because effectively, yeah. So I'm just gonna erase this because it's in the next slide and you don't really, that's not really the point of this thing. But from here, we got that uh, the function is zero from uh, t minus three to infinity. And then from here, we got that the function was uh, zero from negative infinity. This shouldn't be a negative, to uh, two, right? So if t is less than, uh, sorry, sorry, if, uh, da, da, da. if t minus three is less than or equal to two, what you would have is that uh, this is zero from negative infinity to t minus three, and then from uh, two to infinity, because remember t minus three is going to be less than two. So one way to put it, one, one way to put it, if I drew this on the number line, right? Here's two, and then it's zero in this whole range going that, that way, right? If I place my t minus three here, t minus three, then it's zero here. So it's gonna be zero everywhere, basically. So the only way I can get a non-zero thing is if t minus three is greater than two. Because otherwise the, the two things match and so the integral is just arbitrarily zero. Is that making more sense? So here, mathematically, I'm trying to write this that basically, so you need to basically, if whenever, uh, this condition is met, I will have that the integral is uh, zero. Because what this condition is really saying is that t minus three could sit somewhere here. And so that means that the function is zero from here to here, the function is zero from here to here, and some function is zero everywhere. Um, but as soon as, it, as soon as this t minus, this inequality is not valid, then the function is non-zero in this little interval. And so we do have to do the integral. So that's how we get this condition here that t, whenever t minus whenever t minus three is less than two, the, the integral has to be zero. And then we basically do a little algebra to get that it's whenever t is less than five. All right, so that's kind of a, so that's how you integrate this. Um, we expect you to know how to integrate basic functions like uh, x to the p, where p is any number, e to the p t sine p t cosine p t. Uh, we don't really expect you to know anything much more complicated than that. So uh, if you know how to integrate these canonical functions, you should be okay. So this is not a Calc 2 class. Uh, what's new here is kind of setting up these convolution integrals and making sure you have the limits correct. Okay, so okay, so now we're gonna go back to our favorite example. So last class we went over uh, how to integrate uh, two pulses. And uh, in particular, we kind of said that if W2 had a smaller width than W1, we would get a shape that looked like this. And uh, in particular here, based on, if you were to see this plot here, uh, where the peak is three, and then the 
kind of different, the, the flat region has a length of one, would you be able to know what W1 and W2 is? Well, I guess let, let's think through this, this integral. So we, so we said that this W2, right? Is, is less wide than W1. So I'm just gonna draw W1. And then let's say I'm doing the convolution with uh, W2. So W2 will be the blue one. So we said that basically when we were here at some time, the function would be zero then we would kind of keep increasing time, keep increasing time, and eventually we would reach this point, right? Where uh, they overlap, but there's no, uh, uh, there's no area overlap. So basically the integral was zero. And then as we kept moving forward, eventually we would hit this place. I remember that the height of both of these was one. And so what does the value of the peak tell us about the width of the blue curve. Yeah, so the width of the blue curve is three because uh, basically the integral of the product of one times one will be equal to the overlap, which is just the width. And so, uh, so from zero to W or one, which is actually equal to, sorry, this is W2 and W2 because that's the less white one. So this will give you W2. And so here we can see that it's three, so that's equal to three. So from this plot, you already know that W2 equals three. And so now that you know that W2 equals three, what other information could you use to get what W1 is? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if I look at this figure here, right? If I increase time by a little bit, now this pulse will move in a little bit. If I increase time by a little bit again, then the pulse will move it in a little bit. And then if I keep increasing time, eventually I will reach kind of the other edge. And so the amount of time that it takes for this pulse to reach that other edge, which would correspond to kind of going from this point and this point to this graph, because as I move this pulse to the left, the area, the, the value of the integral wouldn't change because it's completely engulfed by the red one. It's actually, remember from here, let's say this is zero and let's say this is W1, this is W2. So that distance from here to here it's actually W1 minus W2, but it's also the distance here, W1 minus W2. And so that means that W1 minus W2 equals W1 minus three, which equals one. And so that gives us that W1 equals four. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Oh, so remember convolution means, I'm gonna, the, the convolution integral means this, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of piece of W uh, one of tau, convolved with piece of W2, so T minus tau, okay? So because this is an even function, when I change the argument, it's just like a symmetric uh, change about the argument. So basically piece of negative tau is equal to piece of tau, but then as I move T, what that's effectively doing is just moving the uh, poles to the right here, right? So if I write this function, assuming t equals zero, it just looks like this. If I write this function, assuming t equals negative 50, then it's gonna be kind of shifted to the, wait, to the left. Wait, if I evaluate this at t equals uh, 
yeah, negative 50 is shifted to the left or very far away to the left. And so as I increase T, this function moves to the right. So this could be for T equals one, this is what the function would look like as a function of tau. For T equals two, it moves to the right a little bit. And then for T equals three, it keeps moving to the right. Uh, but at some instant in time, you can, be, you can choose this T so that this uh, blue curve actually ends up sitting kind of snug with this one. And so that's where you would end up with this part. So that actually here occurs at times three, but then at some other instant in time, right? This thing will be completely here. So are you understanding how that thing is moving or not? Okay, cool. Okay, so to get the area, all I have to do is now evaluate kind of the product of these two things. But we know that PW sub tau equals one, PW two sub tau equals one, but then the only region where they're non-zero is like from zero or from whatever this number is to uh, W2. And so whenever, when you're in this situation, this integral actually becomes the integral from zero to W2 of P of one, the tau. And that gives you that it's actually W2. Go ahead. So the area under the flat region will always be um, yeah, yeah, of the smaller, of the skinnier poles, of the two. Yeah, yeah. And if there, if, and if this thing actually is a triangle, that means that the two pulses have the same width, because they literally only overlap in an instant in time. So as you increase w two, eventually, kind of this, if w two is the same width as w one, then you're going to have this thing be equally wide. And so they're only kind of completely overlap for one instant in time, and then they're gonna not. And so that's why this will look like a triangle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess, uh, so, so, okay. So this is the question we just went over, but now we have another question. So we already know that this is a uh, one we said, and this is four. Oh, wait, sorry. This is four and this is a uh, three. Um, so what would be the value of B if now you have three times PW? Yeah, exactly, nine. So remember in the previous slide, we really, we, we showed you a plot. Uh, We showed you a plot of in the next we showed you a plot of the integral of pw1 or actually pw1 involved with pw3 2 and we said that actually the y-axis was actually three well now we're doing pw1 involved with three times pw2 well, that's just equal to uh, three times the integral of PW1 tau PW1 two T minus tau T tau. And so if this integral was, the peak of it was three, then what would be the new peak now that we added this three here? Yeah, it's just nine. And so what, one way to make these kinds of questions more interesting is to actually give you something like this and then ask you, what is W1? But then if, if there's a nine here, you would automatically say, oh, sorry, what is W2? You would just say, oh, it's just a nine over three because there's a three in front here. And that gives you three. Is that clear? Question? Wait, so sorry, what is it's just three times pw2 so basically it's a function that is uh so basically it's like the same function but now it's three at the peak it's just the function multiplied by three how does that change so um like considering you're thinking about when it overlaps if pw becomes greater than 
the second one even greater than the first one? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess. Well, yeah, we, we're not dealing with infinitely high, but let's just say it's three. <laughs> uh, let, let's keep it. Uh, okay, so if it's higher, you're really looking at the product of one times three, right? Because this is one in this little range. And this is three in the other little range. And so you're really integrating three as opposed to one. Does that make sense? Don't we just care about the overlapping here? We do to find the limit. So remember here, you're integrating from negative infinity to infinity, but then you say, wait a second, this thing is uh, zero from negative infinity to zero. So then this limit becomes zero. And then this thing here is in zero from W2 to infinity. So here's W2. And so now, uh, so you only care where both of them are non-zero but you still multiply out the values of the function on that overlap region. And because the pulses here were both one, we just really didn't care about the magnitude because one times one is one. But once this thing becomes three, then it's one times three. And so then you have to actually say, oh, well, it's three. That make more sense now. So we care about the area of that entire square, not just the area that they overlap. We care about the area of the product of the two. Oh, okay. So that's why there's a product here. And we just forgot that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we care about the area of the product. Yeah. So now it's like the area of the small box times the area of the big box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except before, both of them had a height of one, so you just didn't care about that. Okay, so that's... uh. Cool, so that's convolution. Next week, we're gonna go over discrete convolution, which is an interesting topic that is very useful, but not very useful for this class. All right, uh, we have 10 minutes, so let's just go over the circuit really quick, at least set it up, and then maybe you can do it at home. Okay, so here we're gonna try to solve this switch circuit. And so to solve this search circuit, we first we need to find the differential equation, solve for time less than zero. So let's just first solve for time less than zero. So to determine, so we always assume that the circuit's been in the first state for infinite time. And so what does that say about how the capacitor behaves? Yeah, so it's been on this state for a long time, so it behaves as an open. So that means that the voltage here would be three. Uh, because there's no current flow from here to here, so I equals zero. And the how does the inductor behave? Short. Okay, so that means that the uh, inductor, the uh, cur the voltage here would actually be zero. And so what is Vc sub zero? So Vc sub zero minus, which equals Vc sub zero plus equals three. Cool. Now, what is the value of, uh, of the inductance? Sorry, uh, of the inductor current. Yeah, so this thing behaves as an open. So the current going into here should actually be zero. And so we have that I L so zero minus equals I else of zero plus, which equals zero. Cool. So those are two initial conditions we have. Uh, but now actually, it, as it turns out, we need, if we're gonna solve for I L, we actually need to know what the dt of I else of zero is. And currently we just have these two initial conditions. So we're gonna have to do a little trick because uh, we actually, the derivative of the inductor current is actually not continuous at uh, zero. And so we cannot use the time less than zero conditions to actually come up with the ILDT. We can only come up with these initial conditions, but we can actually convert these into these as we will see in the next step. Okay, so using KVL kind of 
if five in, in this circuit, five volts should be equal to what? Well, no, here it's connected. So we're looking at time greater than zero. So it should be it should be equal to five times what? Yeah, so five times IL. Uh, and then we need to add to that uh, DC sub T, yes. And then we need to add to that. Uh, yeah, so we have plus L D D T of I L sub T. Okay, well, at this point, we can actually get our initial condition for D I L D T because we have VC we have IL, and so we say basically five volts equals five times zero plus three plus L D D T of IL of zero. And so we can move the three to the other side, and so we get that, and, and this is one Henry, so we get that DIL of zero is actually equal to two. Is that good? Yeah. And this should actually be well, L D I L D T. So this should be bolts. Uh, L is one, so it's kind of trivial. Uh, so is the this makes sense to derive the differential equation? Yeah, question. So this is a second order differential circuit because it's got a resistor, sorry, an inductor and a capacitor. And so we need two initial conditions. One is for our unknown and another one for its time derivative. Uh, and we do have two initial conditions, except because the two continuous quantities are actually the capacitor current and the inductor current. Those are the two initial conditions that we always get. So in this particular case, we have to convert this initial condition into an initial condition in terms of IL. If we were trying to solve for VC, we would have to convert for an initial condition of the derivative of VC. Um, so that's kind of a, a trick thing that you kind of have to consider that when you're looking at initial conditions, you always have to look at the continuous quantities. And that's why we kind of focus on continuous quantities. If I had tried to determine L D I L D T is of zero from this circuit, I would have gotten the wrong answer. So I would have actually gotten that it's zero. And it's actually not zero. It's two because at time equals zero, as soon as you flip that switch, that's a discontinuous quantity. So it jumps. Okay, so now you have your initial condition. So now we just have to derive a differential equation, which we kind of already did, but uh, I guess we can do it again. All right, so the differential equation is basically that five equals five times uh, I L plus uh, V C of T plus uh, D D T of I L sub T. Um, so we need to get rid of the V C of T. And so, so we know that IL is actually also equal to the current across the capacitor, right? Because it's the same current that goes through the resistor and the current that goes. Through. So it's just CDVDT. And so what we can do is just take the derivative of both sides and multiply by C, and that allows us to replace this with IL. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I mean, you know, the people say engineers are not creative, but I, I disagree with them. Yeah, so then when you take the derivative of both sides and you solve for the here, I'm just gonna go ahead and go to the next page. And so here I have the equation that I had on the previous slide. The, this is the next equation. Took the derivative of both sides and multiplied by C. Uh, and that gave me the differential equation, but then I wanted it to look pretty. So I uh, divided by LC so that this coefficient in front of the square term was one. 
And then you have to basically find the, so it turns out that because this is a, a, uh, because this is a constant, a DC part, this derivative turns out to be zero. And so actually you get, you end up with just a homogeneous solution. So you just have to solve for the homogeneous part. So basically the derivative of five, ddt of five equals zero. So on the left-hand side, you're gonna end up with zero, uh, but, the, but you still have that initial condition which actually drives the circuit. So first you have to solve for the lambdas. Once you solve for the lambdas, you apply initial conditions to get your uh, solution. And that's how you get the solution to the circuit. So the only tricky part about these new, or the only new thing is finding these initial conditions. After that, you're just solving circuits like we did last week. Question, yeah. From the first line to the third line, how do you go from the DC of Q to the IL of Q? Okay, so here I just took the derivative and multiply by C, the derivative, multiply by C, the derivative, and multiply by C, the derivative, multiply by C. And so then this becomes a second order derivative times C. This becomes a first order derivative times C, but that's just equal to IL. C, V, C, C, V. So this becomes IL. And then this becomes a first order derivative times C. Um, and then the, on the left-hand side, I have the first order derivative. So that's how you got rid of that variable. So I guess most of these will fall apart automatically once you derive that first equation, you're gonna have a variable that you don't know what to do with it. And most likely, if you just look at the IV relationships for that variable, the thing will just fall apart. Uh, so if you're stuck, just write out the IV relationships. It will likely help you a lot. Yeah, so that's how you uh, solve the circuits. Uh, this is basically what we went over last week. At, at this, Basically, after you get here, it's all last week material. Um, okay, so most of you... So I guess just before I kind of close out these two topics, you need to know how to solve RC, RL, RLC circuits. You need to know how to do convolution, but you need to kind of be able to derive these limits if you're given any kind of time shifted unit step function in your inputs to those convolutions. So if you're not understanding these uh, arguments about where to, how to set up those limits and what multiplies the integral, you need to continue working on that because that's not going to go away. Um, and that's, I think, if you understand those two things, you are in somewhat of a very good shape. Of course, there's other details that you will also see, but those are kind of the main things that we, those are basically the non-negotiable things for us. All right, thank you. I'm just going to do a